some years ago you've been staring at a movie called Some Kind of Monster. If mm -hmm. there was a sequel, what would be the title? <laughs> uh, some Kind of Monster would be... Oh... Uh, some kind of recovery, I guess, or uh, I don't know, I would say new kind of monster. You know, we've, I think we've created a, 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 a new life after death <laughs> type of feel. I think that, that sane anger, all of that was a chapter that has closed and it feels like it, it was very uh, cleansing. And it really, it, it, it had to happen, we understand that. Uh, but it was difficult, very difficult, and it felt like a near-death experience for Metallica. And we have, I think we have like extra life now because of that. I feel that all the things I've understood about the near-death experience, when you finally realize what things you do have, the gratitude you need to show for them, you become extra alive. And that's, I think that's where we are right now. So you're so very alive. I heard a record, it's, congratulations, it's a great record, I think. Thank you. But it's titled Death Magnetic. <laughs> mm -hmm. So how does this go together, this feeling of being so alive? Well, I think the concept of death magnetic, uh, all, you know, two years of writing songs and trying to have lyrics from the very beginning so we can mold the songs around uh, the phrasings or, you know, vocals being an important instrument. Going through lots of different concepts and phases in two years, uh, you know, thought process, where I'm in, you know, what I'm influenced by, uh, one of the things was, working with Rick Rubin, I started to rediscover Johnny Cash. And I saw an interview with Johnny about his actual near-death experience, where he saw the light and the tunnel and everything. And the way he described it was powerful. And when he came back, he, he had this new love of life and an intensity around it. And nothing else got in the way of that. Things would, things were not important except those things. And I, I somewhat connected with that because of Metallica almost disappearing or disintegrating. So death, in a new light, uh, death is not a new subject for us. <laughs> but the way we're writing about it now, or the way I'm perceiving it, is the positive side, <laughs> maybe, of death, or maybe death is not the end. Getting close to death does things to people. Um, death Magnetic was chosen out of just a set of lyrics as the title because it seemed to thread all these songs together. And Death Magnetic, it, it, the two words together are interesting that, you know, a magnet has the pull. Why are some people drawn towards it? Why do people leave us earlier? Um, certain people in rock and roll even in our generation, have been drawn towards it. Uh, you know, overdosing on drugs or whatever it may be. And then the other side of that, the pushing away, the other side of the magnet pushes away. And to me it was interesting that a lot of people, especially in my growing up, my religion, not a lot of talk about after someone died, there was no funeral, there was no anything. It was just, they were gone. No grieving. Uh, there was not a lot of talk about death. Even when, 
you know, one of our three cats was all of a sudden not there anymore. <laughs> Dad, what happened? Oh, she ran away, you know. Yeah, <laughs> ran away into the backyard under some dirt. <laughs> but uh, not a lot of talk about it. So the fear of death or the, the not wanting to talk about it, even when you're in a, like a room where, like my mom was passing away in front of us. There was no talk about it. The big white elephant in the room, no one wants to speak about it, at least in my upbringing or in America a lot. Um, so the two sides of that have seemed pretty interesting. Death, of course, is a, a constant theme in your, in your lyrics. Um, do you feel an attraction by death? I don't, I think there's, a, there's both. I think the attraction, uh, getting to the edge of life, <laughs> Uh, feeling alive by fear of death, uh, wanting to wanting to have the adrenaline hit all the time. Um, it became addicting, and obviously some of the antics on the road, uh, you know, you're, I certainly could have died many times, and I think everyone can share that somewhat as a universal feeling oh that time when the red light was red or something but there's always something that that was close and uh uh i think also the just the fear the fear of death what is what is what is going to happen why the feel i i have a need to know a need to control it but i don't think i want to know it's 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 just a constant Constant kind of battle for me, being okay with it, and then not being okay with it, back and forth. I think in a way you're such a, a tough guy. You're going hunting. You're doing the, the, driving with a shopper, and and yeah, and perhaps do you have the feeling that um, many years you lived up to some kind of rock and roll cliche, or Absolutely. is this? Absolutely, I think n no no secret that. The James Heffield on stage is what I would like to be, but I'm not. I'm not that all the time. It's, I think it's less of a conscious effort to portray an image, because I think the music really does something to the four of us when we play it. We go to another level. <laughs> We make faces that we don't normally make. <laughs> uh, we, we sweat more, we, we move differently. It just, we're on a different plane. And when there's an audience out there, like at Rock and Ring or wherever, it, it pushes you higher. You're pushing each other to new, uh, like, it's like you're in the Olympics. <laughs> you go past where you just were, you know? But also that, that, I think that trying to take that image off stage and, you know, I like bikes, I like cars, I like driving fast. Uh, but yeah, there's always a soft side to everyone. Pretending that there isn't is a problem. And I think that's where I was. Uh, not wanting to be vulnerable ever again after being hurt so many times, or, you know. I'll always leave the girlfriend because I was hurt once or, you know, that, that kind of feel. Um, obviously some kind of monster has shown a different side <laughs> to Metallica. Uh, and that's, I think that is stronger, you know, exposing your weaknesses is a pretty strong move. Was the alcohol some kind of escape? Absolutely. Alcohol was, uh, ever since, well, I think ever since my mother died, that became more of a part of me. Alcohol, at age 13, uh, uh, or no, sorry, 16, uh, it became, you know, it starts off as the cliche, hey, I feel 
more alive. I feel looser. I feel more comfortable. I can talk to women. Uh, I can, you know, get on stage and all of this. Uh, it was, it was kind of the fog. I was already in somewhat of a fog, and that helped it be more fun. Um, and then the, the typical story of starting to need it. And then it became just like this maintenance. And it was a constant fog and a lot of things I can't remember. You know, blackout drinking was, was not good. Uh, getting in fights, uh, all kinds of, you know, a trail of destruction, the, the cliche of that. Um, but then it, it, it certainly got more and more evident that it was changing me. I was bringing some of the road life home, and now I had a family and children, and it certainly wasn't a good combination. Um, but yeah, it was the enabler. It enabled me to be more of me, I thought, when in fact it was showing less of the real me. I got a friend, he's 28, and he's drinking since he's 20. What would you tell him? What can you tell him? How can you find a way to stop it? What, what is the, yeah, how can you manage to stop it? It's a huge mm -hmm. effort, I think. Well, it, it really does depend on the person, and it's a, it's a personal journey. I had to hit the bottom. <laughs> I, I didn't, I was pretty stubborn, I didn't learn. I had tried to stop for a year and it just wasn't fun, so I went back to it. And I had, I had to have someone tell me, you know, someone, basically my wife threw me out of the house and said goodbye. It took that shock, you know. And fear is a pretty good motivator. Because <laughs> uh, I certainly didn't want to stop drinking even then. But I knew that I couldn't live without my family. That was more important. And well, when I found out there were other people in my situation that, you know, the deepest, darkest, ugliest secrets you have are just poison and they're rotting inside you. No matter what you're hiding, someone else can say they've done that too. So, there is a connection with humans through experience to show that it can be done. Lars told me in June that by looking at you, and how you changed and how you managed to change during the recording process of some kind of uh, uh, St. Anger. <clears throat> he learned so much about himself. Would you say, how has the balance in the band changed after this experience? Or the commu communication, perhaps, is a better word. <clears throat> well, after St. Anger, uh, we have done, s well, during St. Anger, we had done so much work, personally, uh, you know, as a group with our families, so much, so much work was put into that. Death Magnetic is the fruits of all that hard, hard labor. Uh, I think Lars and I are better at choosing our battles. We don't have to wear the armor all the time now. I think we realize that we need and love each other more than we hate each other. <laughs> uh, I think also we understand each other more through the movie and we stand, understand more about ourselves, which is the most important part. I see myself in that movie and think, I don't want to be that. I don't want people to see me as that. I wouldn't want to be around that guy. And I think Lars has realized some of that himself. So we've all taken a good inventory of ourselves 
and it's been a great mirror. So I think we choose our battles, and the battles we do fight, we know, we're aware that they have to be, but passion rules. Wherever the passion lies, that's the answer. That's great. Um, I have to make a change of topic, <laughs> I think, <laughs> because time is running, mm -hmm. but uh, there are some of your songs still rumored to be used in Guantanamo or in, uh, in, in the camps. <laughs> As, yeah, and uh, they are played hours after hours for, for, the, for the victims and uh, the prisoners. Um, what you, do you think of this? You know, if I heard uh, some Arabic music <laughs> for 24 hours straight, I think I'd go crazy too. It's just, I think it's just putting, you know, they're trying to make them as uncomfortable as possible. Is this talk show for you? <laughs> if I listened to Metallica 24 hours a day, it would be torture, for sure. You know, it's just a thing. Part of me is proud because they chose Metallica. You know, it's, it's, it's strong. It's, it's music that's powerful. It's, it's, it represents something that they don't like. Maybe freedom, uh, aggression, uh, I don't know, uh, yeah, freedom of speech. Uh, and then part of me is, you know, kind of bummed about it that people worry about us being attached to some political statement because of that. We've got nothing to do with this and we're trying to be as apolitical as possible because I think politics and music at least for us, don't mix. It separates people. It, we want to bring people together. And uh, so, so be it. I can't say stop. I can't say do it. It's, it is just a thing. It's not good nor bad. Why can't you say stop? You well, say, I don't, you I don't want it. it to stop. I, I, there's a part of me that thinks, that's kind of proud that, hey, they've chosen Metallica as something that's it's going to affect them. And that's what I want our music to do. I want it to affect people. <laughs> but it does harm to the people. And How it, does it harm them, though? It's violent. If you, if you hear an, uh, any pop song, if it's Sesame Street, about 10 hours in huge, very, very loud, it does harm to oh, them. So, oh, so, okay. They feel uncomfortable. Right, right, yeah. It's not the. It's not what music it is. It's the, the torture yes, part. Of course. Torture through music. Hmm. <laughs> well, I've had to listen to radio for many years. <laughs> I've been tortured. Voluntarily. <laughs> yes. Yes. Sometimes, whoever's driving gets to control the radio. <laughs> If I'm in the passenger seat, I have to listen to uh, Phil Collins on our whole drive while my wife drives. <laughs> is metal... Well, there's music which is political, of course, those folk singers and something like this and Rage Against the Machine. Mm. Is metal... Uh, what, what's the relationship between politics and metal? Is metal the uh, anti-part, the counterpart of politics? Does it always um, have nothing to do with politics? Or is it just Metallica? Well, our music... Uh, I think it's, we're talking about uh, human emotion, hopefully a universal feel of, you know, the feelings of humans. Um, we're not trying to make a statement. I think we're, the statement we're making is death, fear, uh, confusion, uh, wonder, Uh, human emotions, you can attach them politically if you wish, but it really bothers me when popular musicians or any, any, any celebrity is soapbox, soapboxing, talking about their political beliefs. I think that's freedom of speech, and I love that. They can do that all they want. 
but what bothers me is that people believe that their their opinion is more important because they're popular. I'm not. I, I don't believe that. Um, and I'm just. I don't want to back anybody because. A week later, they might might say something that I don't believe in. It's putting our music into the into a person to to take it somewhere. It it cheapens it to me. I think our music goes beyond politics. Politics bore me. Politics they separate, especially in the states. For me, they they separate people. I, I want it to come the other way. So. You're always going to lose some fans if you say something that you might believe politically. I want to go past that and get human. I was just thinking myself. It was four or five months ago. I had uh, REM here, Michael Stipe, mm -hmm. political band, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, of course, music has the power to bring people together and perhaps. To uh, yes, to gain some audience for political issues, to for for good things about it, mm. um, but you just said you never you never would do this, and probably you won't understand any people who back up for Obama right now. Right now in Denver, there's the <laughs> Congress of the Democrats. Do, do you discuss politics in the band, or have you an opinion, or are you on different sides of the road? Well, I th I think within the band, there's lots of different opinions. We're we're all pretty opposite. And that's fine. That's probably a main reason we don't bring up politics because it doesn't speak for all of us. Uh, my theory is, in the United States at least, the two parties, they need each other. And it goes like this, then it goes like this, and it, it's the same thing over and over. Once they balance each other out. But I'd rather they balance it out through positive motions than mudslinging or negativity. And it, it, they try to gain popularity through negativity. And I don't, I don't like that. I don't like that. Um, so yeah, within the band, there's different beliefs. So it wouldn't be universal. Um, but I, I believe that I have faith in man. <laughs> that the will to survive and the will to do the right thing will always will always be victorious. Perhaps getting it close down to um, there's so many things I just want to know, but there's only three minutes left, so <laughs> just let, uh, let's just uh, put it down. There's always, in some kind of monster, there's some kind of a battle, perhaps not a battle, but the conflict is mostly between you and Lars. <laughs> what would you say, what's the role that Kirk's playing in the band? Well, my, when I close my eyes and envision the four of us, it's, I like cars, so we're all in a car. <laughs> I'm driving, of course, but Lars is, has a steering wheel also. <laughs> or we're fighting over the steering wheel that's in the middle, you know. And, uh, and Kirk and Rob are on the back. And they're having fun. Lars and I are fighting over direction, where to go. And they're in the back having fun. Playing games, eating snacks, whatever they are doing. Uh, and they're having fun. And then they every once in a while ask, you know, Where are we going? And we tell them, well, after we argue about it a little while, tell them, and then they say, cool, I'll be there. And that's how it is. There's A and B personalities in the band. It's a good balance now. And their major contribution is to follow. And that's a tough one to do, or at least in my mind, it would be very tough to do. So it's they're as needed as much as we are. One emotional moment for Kirk, I think, in some kind of monster, mm. when he's told that he is not allowed to play solos. <laughs> that poor guy. Who told him? I don't remember. That's difficult. I don't know if it was uh, Lars or you. I don't know. I think that whole thing, the no solos, was just part of... It was part of a phase, a new new, uh, I don't know, an experiment. It was too bad. 
poor Kirk. Because I do most of the rhythms on the album and even the harmony things. So Kirk's contribution was not so much. And, and you know, God bless him for sticking through that because it would have drove me crazy. Last question. Mm -hmm. What will happen on the day that never comes? Hmm. Well, the sun will shine <laughs> and it all be revealed. Uh, the crew have renamed that song, The Day Off That Never Comes. So I think that's pretty fitting. <laughs> Metallica is on and we're on tour, workaholics. Yeah, we go and go and go. So they never get a day off. <laughs>